Okay, let's uh, come around this way. Okay, we can move over this way. Uh, so uh, this is the part of the garden that we really enjoy uh, the most. Um, out here we can f feed the koi. And over here to cross this stream, I wanted to make it uh, very natural looking, kind of like if you're out in the mountains and got to get across a stream, well, you'll find some rock in the stream that you can step on part way across and then finally get across to the other side. Welcome everybody here uh, to our garden. This is the front yard of the garden and uh, you can get a, a general view of it. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, yellow and green plants that you see are a, uh, a Japanese forest grass called uh, Hakone Kloa. And um, it, it um, spreads slowly. Uh, each year I need to cut back somewhat on it, but it makes a nice uh, contrast color-wise uh, compared to some of the other plants. It's a narrow leaf for a grass, uh, contrast to the hosta back there. <coughs> And then uh, if you uh, look over here, you'll see uh, the, uh, kind of a dwarf hosta, somewhat golden uh, uh, edges on it. And this is the uh, Himalaya maidenhair fern uh, um, from the Himalayas that's a semi-evergreen. It, it stays green in the early part of winter, but then finally will uh, brown out near the end of the winter and then send up new fronds in the spring. So this garden does have a lot of shade, so you'll see a lot of shade-loving plants. <clears throat> okay, uh, we can move around. Uh, <clears throat> oh, there, there's a, uh, uh, a nice compact kind of ground cover here <clears throat> called desert moss. Uh, it's a uh, uh, Arenaria Wallawa Mountain comes from the eastern part of Oregon uh, in the mountains there. It, it's not a true moss, but it, it looks somewhat like moss. Well, I, I wanted to have, uh, of course, uh, plants up close to the house other than grass. Um, I like to have some grass so that it, it, you get a contrast between the more natural area where the plants are uh, and then the, f the flat, more formal area of the grass. So I think that makes a nice contrast. And of course the grass where you can walk around easily and see things. As far as other things in the front yard here, you'll see kind of around this uh, large tree, again, a lot of plantings, um, rather than having the tree just coming right out from the grass. Okay, there's a, um, uh, several ferns here. You know, the, you'll see this, I think, is a, called burgundy lace fern. And then uh, uh, next to the uh, Himalaya maidenhair fern, uh, here we have a, um, a rhododendron that's about done blooming, uh, Wojnar's purple. Um, it's fairly reliable. It, it didn't put out many blooms this year. So, uh, some years it'll put out a lot more blooms. But we'll see more rhododendrons in the, uh, the backyard when we get back there. Yeah, you'll, you'll see a, uh, a somewhat yellow-green colored hosta. Uh, a large leaf makes a nice contrast with a very finely divided Himalayan maidenhair fern. Uh, with, with rock gardening, the majority of the flowers you get tend to come in the spring, April, May, early June. And uh, through the summer and early fall, uh, you don't have so many flowers. And so I like to rely upon uh, contrasting 
uh, colors and shapes of leaves uh, to get interest in the garden. Um, the, let's see, there's a plant here that uh, does nicely uh, for us in Colorado. It's a Campanula, uh, Dixon Gold. The, the leaves, again, are kind of a, a yellowish-green color, and you'll notice I have quite a few of uh, yellowish-green color plants. That one I was just pointing out to you, then a more dwarf hosta next to it, and then the, uh, uh, the yellow-green leaves on this. So the, the leaves f form a nice uh, um, uh, color contrast throughout the year. Of course, this time of year now in June, it's in uh, full bloom with a blue color. Let's move around over here. In full sun here, uh, all day long in, in full sun, I have this um, hardy ice plant from uh, South Africa um, that it's about done blooming now, but it does have the yellow blooms uh, that look very nice for uh, near the end of May, early June. And then we have a, uh, a Veronica uh, Roman candle, I think it's called. It's just starting to uh, come into bloom right now. Let's move here to the back. Uh, this, uh, what you were seeing in front of the house is the east-facing area. This is a south-facing area. On the, on the side of the garage. So this gets uh, lots of very hot sun in the summer and uh, is the warmest part of the garden. Uh, so right now we have the uh, Clematis jackmanii uh, that's in full bloom. There are other uh, Clematis uh, in between there. One's got one flower, but it, most of these are blooming a little bit earlier, these other types of uh, Clematis. And then uh, the, here, here's the Veronica uh, Roman candle that's, uh, again, uh, blooming. It, it's pretty much now in full bloom. It's uh, similar to the salvias uh, this time of year. It blooms slightly later than the salvias that look uh, kind of the same as this. And we have a Dianthus with a red flower. Um, several of the, these plants in this hot area that seem to do very well. And uh, some plants here are amongst uh, lava rock. The lava rock, just by itself, I, looks, I think it looks kind of ugly, very sharp edges and, and not very inviting. You, know, you can almost hurt yourself. Uh, but um, anyway, I've put some hens and chicks uh, in with the, uh, uh, the lava rock and it smooths out things and adds a lot of interest. And over here, given another few years, things will spread out more and um, I think everything will look much nicer. Okay, there, there's a nice plant here that uh, I like a lot and a lot of people ask questions about it. It's a, um, a Dianthus, well, it used to be called Dianthus simulans. It, um, botanists uh, seem like have uh, put it in a little different category with a different name, some type of a Turkish plant, but I forget that new name of it. I have another clematis right here that's about done blooming. Um, it, it may bloom later on in the summer, you know, kind of spring and, and uh, early fall, but uh, my plan is to get that to, uh, with the aid of the string here on the rock to kind of creep up along the side of the rock. I do have a um, mist or fog system. Uh, these nozzles here that come on once a day for about 10 minutes that just provide a, um, a cooling effect, uh, puts a little moisture out in the air. Uh, the plants tend to like that, don't, don't get quite so hot in the middle of the day. Comes on, on around noon or so, it's on a timer. 
Um, like I say, that comes on once a day for about 10 minutes. Whereas the regular sprinkler system that waters more deeply once every three days. And uh, uh, so that, that's where a majority of the water for the garden comes from the regular sprinkler. The mist system doesn't use much water at all. Over here, you're seeing some rather large rocks. Uh, ne next to the patio is the largest rock in the rock garden. That one weighs about seven tons. And uh, it's one that the, uh, uh, the crane on, on the truck could not move at a very uh, far distance from the truck itself without tipping the truck over. Uh, so this, I was able to um, have the truck bringing rocks uh, drive up alongside of the garage here and take rocks off of the truck and then place them out in the rock garden. But like I say, th this one was too heavy to move out very far. Uh, but anyway, I, I planned it and wanted to have it right next to the patio area, so that worked out fine. Well, let's see, I did start some rock gardening at the first house I had uh, here in Colorado. Th that was in Boulder. I got started um, doing a um, kind of a small rock garden there. And then when I moved out here to Louisville in the, uh, of around 19... 80 or so, um, I um, w wanted to continue on with rock gardening. I uh, was enjoying it very much, and I had a little more room here in this backyard to do a, a, a much bigger project with rock gardening. The, this is a pie-shaped lot in the backyard here where, where um, at the wide part of the, of the pie shape. Uh, so. Uh, I could bring in quite a few rocks, and I wanted to make things kind of dramatic. Uh, having all rocks similar size does not look very interesting. I mean, it's easy to maybe pick up and carry a rock, you know, like maybe the, the sizes like that. Um, but if they're all kind of the same size, it doesn't look so interesting. As again, where you get kind of a contrast between very large rocks. And, and smaller ones. Uh, so that process of bringing in all the rocks uh, went on for many, many years, probably uh, from starting in the 1980s to uh, up to about uh, f maybe 15 years ago when I brought in pretty much the last rock. <clears throat> and like I say, the, the big rocks, they would use a crane from the truck to uh, place the rock where I'd uh, tell them that I would like to have the rock. Okay, yeah, um, the, here, here's some more of this um, Himalayan maidenhair fern. I have this um, many different places in the garden. I, I like it very much. Um, just a very nice, delicate uh, leaf structure associated with it. There's uh, uh, some other plants here. Here's a dwarf rhododendron that's just beginning to bloom. You'll see over there kind of an orangish red color uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that's been quite reliable, except for uh, two or three years where we had some really strange weather that, uh, that caused it not to bloom. Uh, quite a few years ago, we had a case where our first frost of the season, like in, in November or so, um, it, you know, it hadn't even got down to uh, freezing before that, but the first one that we got got down to minus 20. <clears throat> and a lot of the plants did not like that. Uh, that one, it took a couple years before it really sort of come back again and start blooming. Uh, another plant that had some damage to it, it's a Commociparis obtusa, a dwarf form of that. Um, and um, anyway, it had some dieback. It's starting to finally come back. That, that particular plant is probably about 30 years old. And then over here we have a, a, a relatively common Campanula uh, that's in bloom that's again been there probably 
20, 25 years or so that does not really spread much. It, uh, it just covers up some of the rocks, comes back every year, blooms very reliably. Uh, over here is a, um, uh, a Japanese maple that has a, a, a nice red color in the spring and in the fall. In the summer it's more of a maroon color, it gets a little bit darker in the, in the summer. Here we have some uh, ground covers, a uh, nice contrast between a kind of a, a silver blue color here uh, and more of a greenish color over there. Um, th this particular one, uh, let's see, uh, Antonaria silver carpet. It slowly spreads. I've tried to um, cut it and uh, divide a little bit and get it started other places. It's kind of hard to get started, um, but I do have it started one other place in the garden. Uh, <clears throat> okay, um, over here, um, th this one big rock, the seven ton rock, um, if I had it just there by itself, might look a little bit artificial. So I have um, some of these other smaller rocks around it and providing um, uh, planting places for various uh, rock garden alpine plants. Uh, the cactus on this rock came with the rock. That's the one plant that came with it. The rest I've, I've planted. Now you'll see a, a small pond here. Uh, normally um, I have a little waterfall, um, but uh, unfortunately the, the pump quit on me a few days ago. I have another pump on order, um, but the water would come kind of from back underneath there and then a waterfall in, into that pond and just recirculate. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, get the water supply uh, uh, from on top, uh, had to cut through, drill a hole through the rock about that far to finally get uh, the pipe so the water would come out there. Actually a hidden area, you can't actually see the, the source of the water. Uh, but the pump uh, is in there that draws the water uh, from the pond and then a uh, pipe goes clear around and uh, the, the pipe is hidden underneath uh, the, all these plants to finally where it goes down through the rock. Um, originally, my my wife said uh, when we we had the pond and we didn't have fish in it, uh, she said, "Well, why don't we get some koi?" And at first, I was a little bit reluctant, thinking, "Well, with uh, fish in the pond, it's going to be hard to keep it clean." But actually, it turns out it's just the opposite. The uh, the fish keep it uh, very clean. Um, in addition to eating the fish food, as long as I, we don't feed them too much, they'll eat their vegetables, which is the algae that might grow on the rocks. So they eat that and, and keep the rocks quite clean uh, from the algae. Okay, so I have some water lilies in there that uh, uh, later on in the summer they'll hopefully be out in bloom. The one you see right now is a yellow color, and then the one more in a, in a corner back there with the smaller leaves, that's a uh, kind of a, a pink, a dark pink color. <clears throat> and there, there's a the plant you'll see right here, just starting to bloom. Um, a cyclamen purpurescence. Uh, that's an evergreen. Uh, it's the one cyclamen um, that uh, stays evergreen throughout the year. Um, a lot, lot of cyclamen, one that looks similar to this, will actually go dormant. Um, Oh, probably in, uh, in during June, 
and then come out with a flower in July and, and be kind of evergreen the rest of the year. But this does not go dormant at all. Um, I have this uh, quite a few places in the garden. Uh, a lot of people ask me whether I had a landscape architect uh, uh, help design it and help build it and so on. No, it's something I did myself. And um, starting from about the um, early 1980s, wanting to have a general area here with, with some water features. I knew right where I, I'm standing now it would be a patio just to be able to come out here and, and have dinner outside or, or breakfast or lunch or whatever. And wanting to have the main pond kind of close to that patio area. So, so that was the first part of the vision. And then the vision of, of somewhere higher up having a um, kind of an alpine pond and then some uh, waterfalls and streams coming down from there. I, I was interested in, in, in creating what, uh, what seemed like a, a canyon or a valley and th that's what these two rocks are here. And then so we have an um, intermediate pond in between these two rocks. Uh, these two rocks are the first ones that I bought for the garden. One here and one there. That's about four tons and this is about three tons. So um, I had those brought in place and there was nothing dug out for a pond or anything, but at least I would put them in, in a general area where I wanted to have the pond and then slowly start finding rocks to build up other areas for the upper pond and the stream. The, um, it was over a period of many years bringing in these rocks and placing them where I wanted them, but still not having dug out for the stream or the ponds yet. Once all the rocks were there, um, then I said, well, okay, we can now dig out for the stream and the pond, but we got to move some of the rocks that will be partially in the water. So I had to have the crane come out and pick up some of these rocks, like, uh, like uh, these large rocks and three or four of the other ones up there and several of the rocks around the pond, pick them up and set them aside. Then go in and dig out for the pond and the stream and bring in a rubber liner that's about a sixteenth of an inch thick and line everything with that rubber liner and then have the crane come back and place the rocks on top of the rubber liner. And it, it's uh, pretty tricky uh, design, uh, doing the construction of the, the pond and the waterfalls to make sure that your rubber liner is always up high enough in the right places that you don't get water overflowing the, the liner uh, or you know, creating a leak in the pond. I've been fortunate that so far that there have been no leak in it, uh, as far as I can tell, at least not any significant leak. Um, the, there is a variation in the amount of water that it uses from spring to winter uh, with evaporation in the, the spring and summer. Uh, you'll use a little bit more water in the pond, in the waterfalls. Um, the, uh, the pumps for the pond are in a skimmer o over here. Uh, it skims water, the uh, top part of the water, so anything floating like leaves or pine cones or spruce cones, whatever, will then float into the skimmer and get trapped in, in a net. And then there are two pumps in here. 
uh, one for s summertime use, like that's turned on now, that pumps the water from here up to that upper pond, and you see all the waterfalls coming down from that upper pond. Um, I shut that off in the winter time um, because there's a filter up there that um, has some parts of it exposed that could freeze and, and break, so that, that gets shut off. But in the winter time, the, the pond in between those large two rocks, um, there's water in there, a smaller pump pumps water into that pond that then flows into this larger pond. So you get the circulation, even though it will freeze over, you'll get water uh, circulating kind of underneath the ice, provides the, uh, the air that the uh, koi need. Now the, the koi will hibernate through the winter, st starting in about November, and then they'll come out again in, in maybe uh, late March. There, there's a lot of hiding places for the koi. Uh, when people come to visit the garden, they see the koi. The one question I get often is, do I have problems with raccoons and, and herons and so on, uh, grabbing the, uh, the koi? No, I've never lost any uh, koi that way. And uh, uh, there's, I think, two reasons for it. <clears throat> one is they have a, a lot of hiding places underneath those rocks. Uh, You'll see them going uh, up underneath the, the rock there that you can actually walk on. The water goes clear back underneath that rock and they can hide back under there. There are several other places underneath the other rocks so that if they see a raccoon or a cat or something like that uh, coming nearby, they just go hide underneath the rocks. The other thing is the side of the pond is very steep. Uh, instead of uh, uh, what a lot of ponds you'll see made, uh, gradually slope in where it'd be easy for a raccoon to kind of just walk in and be able to grab a fish. But here, in order to get in, they'd almost fall into the water and they don't tend to like to get into the water. The, um, uh, all the plants on this rock right here, except for this um, it's a ponderosa pine that came with the rock, uh, but because the roots are in the crack of the rock, it uh, grows extremely slowly. Uh, all the other plants, all these ferns that you'll see here and some of the, uh, the dwarf uh, spruce, uh, have come up from seed from ferns, or, or from the spore, from ferns that I have other places in the garden. This rock, since it sits in the water, and it's a, um, uh, all, all the rock are sandstone, there's layers, and the water will tend to seep up through those layers and provide a, a perfect environment for fern spores once they light on in that kind of a moist area to finally turn into the ferns. Here we have a, um, a dwarf rhododendron um, called uh, Mount Seven Star. Uh, I have uh, several of the rhododendrons that are part of the uh, uh, North Tisbury rhododendrons from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Polly Hill uh, was the one there that uh, brought in some rhododendrons from China. Um, actually, I think maybe from uh, Taiwan, and, and propagated a lot of them, and, and I think it's rhododendron nakahari, uh, various uh, hybrids of that, uh, that are extremely reliable here in our Colorado garden. Um, th this one is relatively new. This is maybe only about uh, uh, four or five years old. It's doing well. But uh, one I pointed out earlier has been around for 25 or 30 years or so and blooms about every year. Um, okay, so the, that one is just uh, starting to come out and bloom. Um, uh, rhododendron um, 
North Star, and uh, here's a, a pink one. Uh, this particular one um, kind of uh, called uh, Nukii um, July Rose. Well, so it's it's a good name. It's uh, it blooms in about end of June and beginning of July. Um, pretty much all of these dwarf rhododendrons uh, usually are in bloom on uh, July 4th. Uh, another one in bloom over there, rhododendron uh, rookizan, a dwarf rhododendron that's been there for uh, oh, four or five years. One over here, uh, which is the same as the one that you saw earlier, uh, Rhododendron Alexander. Um, this one's newer. This has probably been here um, five or six years, maybe longer, six or seven years. But um, the Rhododendron Alexander is probably the most reliable one of these dwarf rhododendrons that blooms every year and around the end of June, early July, with the orangish red color. Okay, so you, you'll see another waterfall here and the water going underneath a, a bridge. I found this nice rock that would form a very nice natural looking bridge across the stream. Uh, so again in the, in the design of, of everything, you know, I wanted to have the stream come around here as well as having more of the main stream over there. And uh, so I have two types of crossings. This crossing is with a natural bridge which cross that stream to be able to get into the middle part of the garden. And over here to cross this stream, I wanted to make it uh, very natural looking, kind of like if you're out in the mountains and got to get across a stream, well, you'll find some rock in the stream that you can step on partway across and then finally get across to the other side. Um, I have quite a few Daphne uh, here that they're essentially done blooming now. There happened to be one flower left on it, but the, the Daphne's tend to bloom in uh, generally in about uh, early May, uh, kind of a, a pink to purple pink color. And here's more of this desert moss. You'll see that uh, quite a few places in the garden. Let me point out one thing that I like to use that desert moss for. Uh, I'll show you over here. <clears throat> You'll see the desert moss here. Um, there's sort of two functions for it. One is to look like you're in a natural alpine area, very low growth. Um, so, so this particular upper pond, I call it alpine pond, uh, all the plants around it are very compact, like you might find above timberline. There's another practical reason. Um, I mentioned you need to have a rubber liner to keep the, uh, the water from leaking out into the ground. The rubber liner comes up between, uh, up against this rock here, and I hide the liner with this rock, but uh, there's a tendency for that liner to show unless you cover it up well. And so by having this plant in between these two rocks, it hides that liner and provides a very natural look uh, for an alpine area. The, uh, the water 
before the pond it comes up from underneath under a uh, kind of under a rock there is a uh, kind of a, a plastic fitting that fits uh, uh, waterproof and through the liner itself and over there you can see where that uh, filter is uh, the upper uh, filter for the the pond that keeps everything very clean. It's got an ultraviolet light in it that will kill any um, floating algae. The majority of it is from just traveling in the mountains here in Colorado, you know, hiking up in uh, alpine areas above timberline or through um, woodland areas and so on, of just wanting to create a garden that looked very natural uh, like you're up in the mountains and and so th that's the main goal of the design is to keep things very natural looking so instead of having a pond you know with, with very artificial side just sloping in everywhere uh, having uh, some of the large rocks actually partially submerged in the pond itself I think helps to create that kind of a, a look a uh, more natural look You'll see some of these uh, spruce here. Uh, I did not plant those there. Uh, they, they come from seeds from the, the blue spruce that I did plant. Uh, that one probably in around 1980 or so. Uh, the seeds from that come up various places. I let them grow for a few years until they get out of scale, and then I just cut them back. <clears throat> the one blue spruce here growing in that rock seemed to have a natural dwarf look to it. That's probably been there about uh, uh, 10 to 15 years. Okay, so there's more of these uh, uh, Dwarf uh, Japanese cypress, or the uh, Commissiparis obtusa. Um, there's various forms of that. Majority of them get to be uh, quite large, but these are very dwarf. Uh, uh, Commissiparis obtusa, Nana is one uh, variety. There, there's a lot of named varieties that stay very dwarf like that, that will only grow maybe a uh, quarter of an inch each year. And uh, up there near the top uh, you have a, a Germanium Delmaticum in bloom. So that, that blooms at, at kind of a nice time of year when not too many other things are in bloom. Okay, over here we have another one of these dwarf rhododendron uh, Mount Seven Star. It's called from uh, the uh, the North Tisbury hybrids that originated from uh, Taiwan. Over here we've got um, a mountain laurel called Otspo Red. The um, majority of the mountain laurel have pink buds and then they open up to white flowers. But the Otspo Red has red buds that open up into pink flowers. Uh, and, and they're very reliable here in the garden. Uh, every year pretty much they bloom. And now right next to it, there's a, a nice plant here called Mukdenia that um, in the spring sends up a kind of a starry white flower. And then later on, late summer, early fall, 
the leaves on that plant start turning red, first on the tips and then slowly working back to where pretty much the whole leaf turns red. So it provides a very nice fall color. Uh, also a, uh, uh, a hardy ice plant um, from South Africa. Uh, there's a lot of different varieties of it, various colors. The one you saw in the front of the house was a yellow color, and here's more of a pink color. It tends to close up uh, at nighttime, and then as the sun comes out on it, it tends to open up more. So it, it, it's just starting to open up for the day as the sun starts to shine on it. Uh, they, they like a lot of sun, but now I have that uh, mountain laurel up close to the fence so it gets more shade. Plant here that uh, kind of unique um, called Nandina domestica firepower. Um, has a nice leaf early in the spring and then in the fall turns a very bright red color and um, it, it's kind of evergreen through the winter that is uh, those red leaves stay on it for a long time and they, uh, the late winter it turns brown and then finally they lose those leaves as the new ones come out in the spring. Here I have a lot of balloon flowers uh, and uh, there's a few dwarf ones right here, which I like, that stay compact and a large blue flower. They will they'll start uh, blooming in maybe another uh, couple of weeks or so. Uh, there are other ones that get quite tall that are a little bit of a, a problem. Sometimes they get so tall that they start drooping over. Um, but uh, anyway, it provides a very spectacular blue color in this area when they're all in bloom. And, and that tends to be in the middle of the summer, so it's a good time to be blooming. Here you see a hosta that many people ask about. Sometimes people want to take their picture standing next to it just, just so they can see how big this hosta is. Um, I forget the name of it. Um, I think I do have a tag somewhere down underneath, but it, over the years it's kind of gotten buried by the plant itself. Uh, it came from Arrowhead Nursery in Michigan, a mail order place. Um, but like I say, I forgot the name, but uh, in the catalog it, it mentioned that this was a medium-sized hosta. Well, uh, I wonder really what a large hosta would look like. Uh, but uh, this still will continue to grow over the next few weeks, probably come up uh, about this high or so. The hostas again form nice contrast with the large leaves. Um, one problem with them we have here in Colorado in some years, um, June is notorious for hail here in Colorado. The, the north eastern part of Colorado especially they call Hail Alley. Um, so if we get a, a hailstorm where hails are, are much bigger than, uh, uh, say, marbles, it'll shred this and it'll look awful through the rest of the summer then. So we've been lucky this year, so far no hail. Okay, um, quite a few of the r more regular size rhododendrons are done blooming now. You can, uh, I, I need to come back and, and pull off the, the old uh, flowers. But there is a, a purple one back there that's done blooming, a red one there, and this was a, a pink one. This is a, the most spectacular one and when it's in bloom, kind of a, uh, a very dark pink 
bud that opens up to a real bright pink flower that uh, is very reliable, blooms every year. And then it's next to a, a golden chain tree. You know, this is done blooming, but you'll see the chains that hang down from this that are ye uh, yellow blooms. So that, that has the nice yellow blooms right when this is in, in bloom here with the pink flower. So it forms a nice uh, combination, color combination. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the pink flowers on this also have a nice color contrast with the, the yellow Hakone Kloa. Uh, in the front of the house, you saw the Hakone Kloa that had the variegated leaves, some green and some yellow. This is called all gold. And, and then it has the blue colored hosta next to it. So I think this forms a nice uh, color contrast here. Another one of these uh, North Tisbury hybrid uh, dwarf rhododendrons. This is about done blooming, but again, it's a very spectacular one that blooms. Um, it blooms a little bit earlier than the others. Uh, this blooms near the beginning of June. I think this one's called uh, uh, Fairfax. Uh, another rhododendron, more of a regular size one back here that's done blooming that has a light yellow color on it. Uh, this is probably the, the best one in terms of the leaf color through the winter. Uh, those leaves stay exactly that same green color, kind of a shiny green throughout the winter. And uh, so it looks very nice even in the winter time. Uh, here's a, uh, a plant, Lamium, or dead nettle as it's called. Uh, Lamium comes in a variety of leaf colors. Um, majority of them are more or less a green color, but this particular one has a very bright yellow color and, and then a white flower. I really like this plant, again, for the color contrast, and it is an evergreen uh, plant. That is, it, it stays this yellow color, maybe not quite as bright as it is now, but it's pretty close to that color all through the winter. And, and so, in a, a dark winter day, this really stands out then when you see that nice bright yellow color. It's uh, kind of difficult to propagate. I've tried several times to take, as it wants to creep into other plants, to cut back on it and transplant it some other place in the garden. Um, but it tends to have long stems. It's hard to actually get at the roots itself. But there's one place I've been successful. A couple years ago I got it started. And then here's a, an orchid, Dacleriza, that has very nice mottled leaf color. Um, well, I think we've made uh, the rounds of the garden and looked at everything here in the garden. Um, so I certainly thank you for spending the time here in our garden. Uh, um, both uh, myself and my wife, Chi Chi Shin, uh, thank you for coming to visit.